Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm Juliana Forlano. Today on the program, we're going to be covering the patriotic millionaires get together. And no, that is not a joke. Uh, the millionaires apparently are trying to fight the billionaires. And we're going to talk about millionaires trying to fight oligarchy. And that will be uh, very interesting. So stick with us for that. First up, we have the headlines where we're going to cover. We're going to start with President Biden's billionaire minimum tax and end up at throwing a bunch of poor people in jail. Let's see how we get there. All right, let's hey. Joe Biden's new proposed billionaire's minimum tax will make sure that the minuscule percent of folks with more than a hundred million dollars would pay at least a 20% income tax rate, like I am like you probably are. Sounds good, right? Stick it to them, Joe. Now, I'd like to see an attached promise of what that money is going to be used for. Are we collecting what would amount to $80 billion just to hand it over to weapons manufacturers and fossil fuel companies? Or are we planning to fund the green energy revolution at a universal basic income? That's what I'd be for. So what say you, Joe Biden? Biden is also proposing a long overdue corporate tax hike from the current 21% that companies are now evading to a 28% rate that they'll have to circumvent later. By the way, FedEx paid zero taxes in 2020, year of the pandemic and getting everything delivered at home. FedEx paid zero. They even got a $230 million rebate from the government and they still didn't deliver my swim goggles. What's that money for? Anyway, I hate to say it, but I think Biden's ideas may all be kind of a little bit of propaganda, maybe some red meat for the Warren wing. The Warren wing, of course, used to be the Bernie wing. But since Bernie's probably not running for president again, economic progressives are like, Warren, we'll take her. She's all we got. <laughs> anyway, by the way, Fox News is trying to make your pops feel bad for that poor punished billionaire who might not be able to afford his second 18 square mile luxury underground apocalypse bunker. <laughs> Meanwhile, Republicans, or at least this one, we got a picture of Rick Scott here in Florida somewhere. Let me find somewhere. There it is. Uh, Republicans are fighting back with a proposal to raise taxes on the lowest income 40%. Democrats want to raise taxes on billionaires, the people who can afford it. Republicans are wanting to raise taxes on the lowest 40%. By the way, it would be upwards of $1,000 that they will try to squeeze out of people who definitely don't have it every year. That's right. Senator Rick Scott of Florida, where else, <laughs> has proposed that we tax the poor who don't have the money to pay it. It's insane. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what he's thinking. Ask him, I guess. His talking point is about how all Americans should contribute. So get up out of that wheelchair, granny, and pay your fair share, right? Scott's plan is so radical that even some pushback is coming from conservatives, not because they care about the poor, but more so because they care about smearing the Democrats as the tax raiser party. They don't want to be the tax raiser party. Scott's response, yeah, but this tax is for the poors. Republicans don't like the poors. And the poors we do like, the white ones, will just think this is for the ones we don't. Conservatives, <clears throat> that was my Rick Scott impression. Did you like it? <laughs> Conservatives are also concerned that Rick Scott's plan undercuts their other screeching point that the poors are getting a free ride. Well, everyone around here works, mister. If the poor start paying an unaffordable tax, you wouldn't be able to call them welfare queens and Fox News would lose 60% of its daily content. So this is a tricky one for Scott to propose. And at first, honestly, it doesn't make any sense. It hits people with incomes too low to owe any tax anyway. So again, how are they going to pay for it? Will the government be making any money? I don't think so. These folks are going to be racking up debt yearly. And then the IRS will come and seize their stuff, garnish their wages, and make everyone into a scoff law. In some places, up to 50% of the population 
is going to find themselves under the yoke of this unpayable tax. These are mostly mostly the southern states, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, the whole Bible Belt, really. And of course, Senator Rick Scott's home state, Florida, which I guess is the Bible penis. Currently, you can only go to jail for tax law violations if criminal charges are filed against you and you are prosecuted and sentenced in a criminal proceeding. That's unless you're the former president of the United States because that never happened to Trump. The most common tax crimes are tax fraud and tax evasion. By the way, <clears throat> I Googled, can you go to jail for not paying your taxes? And I'm sure that has put me on some kind of IRS watch list. You're welcome. Please donate to my Patreon account to spring me out of that jail once they come and, and grab me. <laughs> anyway, could Rick Scott have an ulterior motive for turning half the South into criminals? Could he? Hmm. Well, uh, in 2028, no candidate in the country received more aid from private prisons than he did. The Geo Group, a company that operates five prisons, um, private prisons, the ones that are for profit, uh, in Florida alone, five in Florida alone. That group and its CEO donated about $400,000, more than $400,000 to Scott's last Senate campaign, along with various connected political committees that he needed, et cetera, et cetera. You may recall the GEO group for being accused by the ACLU of torturing de detainees or being named the deadliest ICE detention center in 2018. But wait, there's more. Geo illegally gave hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Trump campaign and has been sued multiple times for not feeding detainees and forcing them to work for food. Could Rick Scott just be setting up a large portion of the lower income population to feed this private prison industry complex? I'm not saying it's true, but it sure sounds fishy. Remember, tyrants are always playing the long game. I'm Juliana Forlano. We'll be right back with the Action Rundown. TV was able to cover this event called Patriotic Millionaires, Oligarchs versus All of Us, the fight for power and money that happened a few days ago in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, I was not able to go there um, and rub elbows with the millionaires and experts that were talking about the problem with the existence of the billionaire class. Uh, now, for those of us who are in still the five digit incomes or not in, the, you know, or the whatever the digits below million, the, it's kind of, it might sound a little weird. Why are millionaires, you know, they're millionaires, billionaires, they're all in the same class. Well, actually, they're not. And uh, we had some really, there were some really interesting people talking about the difference, uh, talking about their experience and talking about what they as millionaires actually can do to reign in the oligarchy, uh, first off, a very powerful speech. Now, you know here we uh, by Abby Disney, you know I like to cut up the speeches and just give you like the little bites of the speeches, but this one was so good, I think you're going to want to hear it. This is Abby Disney speaking about her dad becoming a smaller man and how money changes you and a lot about the rest of um, the psychology of being a billionaire. Take a listen. This is some awesome billionaire bashing, I just want to say. <laughs> I'm having the best time. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald say, famously said, the rich are different. Um, the rich are different for a reason. This is maybe the most obvious thing ever said, because money changes them. And I'm here to tell you that I've seen it from the inside. Because when I was born in 1960, the Walt Disney Company was a great and successful global company. It was great. It was doing well. But we actually weren't that rich. You know, we kind of lived in a, I shared a bedroom with my sister. And we didn't have, you know, big Rolls Royces or staffs or anything like that. We didn't get really, really, really rich until Ronald Reagan became president. And the handcuffs were taken off the market. And the belief system of Milton Friedman had, had really settled in deeply. 
That was when we became really rich. And I saw my father narrow. I saw him become a smaller man in front of my eyes. He and my mother were the two closest married people you'd ever, ever meet. And I'm going to tell you something incredibly personal and sad. Um, they, they were known broadly as people who just never did anything without each other. They were each other's best friends. And uh, by the end of the 2000s, um, my father up and left uh, for a younger woman a month after their 50th wedding anniversary um, and left my mother alone with Alzheimer's um, that she was start <sighs> starting to have. And, you know, it's funny. People had worked for my father for 40 years plus, and they were dumbfounded. They just couldn't even believe what they saw him do. They were like, I never imagined in my wildest dreams that your father was capable of that. Um, it ruins you. It ruins you. And isn't it ironic that the more money that people have, the more power they wield? They're precisely the opposite of the people that should be making decisions. So I, I was kind of going through a list of the characteristics I've seen develop, because it's not just watching my father hollow out. Um, it was watching um, Davos Man, too, because I've spent some time in Davos and Ted and the Clinton Global Initiatives. And so I've been in the rooms with the billionaires. And I do sometimes feel like an entomologist, you know, looking at bugs from a very far distance. And so I've tried to describe them for myself. And like it started coming out sounding like the seven deadly sins. Um, jealousy. Jealousy. One of the most hallmark characteristics of the billionaire is, but his plane is bigger than mine. But he has more commas than I have. The four comma club, they call themselves, when nobody's around. Um, everywhere you look, there's somebody who has more than you do. And that's not acceptable. That is a really, really horrible way to live your life. Gluttony. Gluttony is more, more, more. It leads to addiction. It leads to compulsion. It leads to suffering. And there is a very important connection between addiction as a personal matter and wealth. Because I come from a family with two alcoholic parents and three alcoholic siblings. So I've watched it happen. If you don't know who you are in the world, if you don't know that you're just a mere mortal, um, there's no way you'll kick your addiction. Ask anybody in the 12-step programs. You, the first thing they made Betty Ford do when she went to the Naval Hospital was scrub the floor. Because you have to strip away from yourself everything that isn't essential. And you're saying zero minutes? <laughs> I'm just getting started. Uh, <laughs> fear. Fear is a driving factor. My, the more money my parents got, the more afraid they became of the consequences of interconnecting or interacting with anyone who wasn't already like them, anyone who they didn't already know would be okay. They didn't like getting in taxi cabs. They didn't get, like getting on airplanes that other people were on. They couldn't handle it because the more money they had, the more they had to lose, the more they felt people were trying to take for granted and to take from them. Coveting. <laughs> it's the seven deadly sins. Um, but the rates of divorce among wealthy people are insane. And just have a look at People Magazine, because there's always a, a lured story about a wealthy family where the dad left the mom. I just told you one of them. But the other thing that comes from that is suicide. Suicides among wealthy people are incredibly high. They're almost as high as the suicide rate among poor people. There's something also I call anagnosia, which is the willed unknowing of things. The choice not to see, not to know, not to connect. You can tell them a piece of information. I've had this happen with my dad. I called him the Pillsbury Doughboy. I would give him a piece of information, and if it didn't fit his story, it would just boop, pop right back out like the Pillsbury Doughboy's stomach. They can't take the information in. And so that leads to a persistent ignorance and alienation. You don't live on the same planet everybody else lives on. You need a special entrance and a special exit. You need a private airplane and a private bar. You don't want to inhabit anything but the stratosphere with people who are like you. 
So there's a detachment from reality, and then comes the selfishness. Like, I need to protect what I have at any cost. I see that my political funding is causing near civil war to break out in this country, and I keep doing it because no one's going to tell me what to do, and I'm not going to I'm not going to give up a penny of what I have. Denial of death. My goodness, this is a really bad one. And if you know wealthy men, especially wealthy older men, they never talk about their own death. They do estate planning because it's part of their tax conversations. But when my father was told that he had cancer and he had a one in 10 chance, he said, great. And the reason he said that was he was always the one in 10 guy all his life. And he was under the impression that, well, if I just get the best doctors and the best hospital, good, I'm fine, I'm gonna be fine. And as a result, he never really said his goodbyes. I always said he died all alone in a room full of people. And, and then there is the self-deception, the self-delusion, the telling yourself you're doing God's work in Lloyd Blankfein's words, or the Benioff thing, telling yourself that what you're doing everybody appreciates and everybody loves. In other words, billionaires are miserable, unhappy people. The billionaire bashing needs to happen. I don't know why we're being so polite. I mean, white fragility is nothing compared to billionaire fragility. <laughs> it is time for heretics and apostates and rude, snobby people like me to call them out. I mean, I have broken the ultimate rule in the film that I made, which was to personally call out Bob Iger for making himself a billionaire on the backs of his workers. And I'll do it again and again. My patron saint, the person that I love the most in the world whenever I think of it, is a woman named Anna Grimke. Anna Grimke was born to a slave-owning family in South Carolina, perhaps one of the wealthiest slave-owning families. She was given a slave her own age at three years old who was expected to sleep outside of her, so her slave was three too. She was expected to sleep outside of her door on the wooden floor outside of her door and attend to any of Anna Grimke's needs in the middle of the night or at any other time. And she grew up like that. And somewhere in her late teens, she said, this is wrong. We never ever hold those stories of people who have the good sense to say, no, 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 this is not okay. I know everybody else is saying it's okay, but it's not okay with me. And she basically said to her parents, fuck your slaves and fuck your inheritance, I'm leaving. She went north to Boston and she became um, an abolitionist. I don't think we've ever lived in a moment where it's been more important to be rude, to be mean, to tell the truth, to call out the people close to you that you love. And how many times have I had it said to me, but Bob Iger is a nice man. So the fuck what? <laughs> I'm sorry, so, cats are nice, you know? <laughs> it doesn't get you into heaven to be nice. It gets you to purgatory. Like if you wanna to go to heaven, you have to make an effort and maybe give something up and maybe notice somebody else's suffering and maybe take that on and see that it has something to do with you. Living in the stratosphere is a great way of saying to yourself, yeah, but I'm up on my cloud and that suffering down there has nothing to do with me. I have never seen the same journalist cover the CEO pay ratio who didn't at the, who also covered the labor issue. Why is our business press thinking those things are separated? They're totally connected. $66 million in one year, in the same year that he knew people couldn't put food on their tables. Like, how do you sleep at night, right? So um, those of us who know and hang out with wealthy people, there's a lot of nodding politely. There's a lot of just letting people say what they say. And I say, well, you know, that's over now. I don't think we need to do that anymore because while the society chose to deify the billionaires, the billionaires listened to that and began to deify themselves. And we need to disabuse them of the notion that they have nothing to do with any of the problems out here. We need to turn our attention to the people who are trying to live in this world on not enough food, on not enough sleep, on no health care. 
on no transportation, on no hope for their children's future. Like, those are the people we need to start caring about, this three-year-old girl sleeping outside of your door on the hardwood floor. That, it's time. And so this is our job. As patriotic millionaires, we need to choose to change the people in our class. And part of the way we need to do that is by taking their faces and just, just pounding them <laughs> with the truth, right? Beautiful. Because you can't watch those folks in my film and not embrace the truth of what is going on in this country. It needs to change fundamentally, and it won't change until we change these people. We'll do it by law, but we'll do it by norms. We'll do it by attitudes as well. So Beautiful. I mean, do you see why I played the whole thing for you? I've got some 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 action in the chat here. I want to say Patricia Longo, who I've seen you in the chat quite a bit in our other shows. So thank you for watching. Uh, the willing, you say the willing unknowing is huge. It gaslights the normal people in my family. Absolutely. I agree 100%. That happens uh, across the board. I mean, she's talking about, Abby Disney was talking about her dad becoming a smaller man. It's funny because those people who don't have a ton of money think my fear of financial insecurity will go away once I get a whole hoard of money. But uh, as it turns out, it doesn't. Uh, Abby even spoke about how, you know, her family was like more afraid because someone will take it and someone will do something. You know, it's it's like the issue is really fear and hoarding. Um, of course, you're more accurate to be concerned if you don't have an income and you're being oppressed by a capitalist system and you would like to keep your children healthy and alive as well as yourself. Okay, I get that. That's for sure a, a thing. You want to, you know, live. But it's just really interesting that that fear follows the very, very wealthy up to the top. Um, they see us as a threat and I hope, hopefully we are. <laughs> at this point, as we start maybe changing the rules and laws, as she said, I think it was really interesting what she said about um, the people in the billionaire class who occasionally rub elbows with the people, or excuse me, millionaire class who are at the event, who occasionally rub elbows with the people in the billionaire class. They have to start changing the dialogue. They have to make it okay with their dialogue, with their interactions that um, you have to give. And that, you know, it's okay to have to pay taxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just like, I, I think that's really good because, you, you know, people have to hear from their, from, from like people. I mean, Abby, she spoke about, um, I think addiction recovery and they say in addiction recovery circles, like a person addicted to X substance has to hear a story of recovery and safety from that same person who was also formerly addicted to X substance, right? So it's the same when you're addicted to money and more, 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 you have to hear from someone else that it's okay to like loosen the reins. A billion is a lot. It's enough. Um, I also like how she said billionaire bashing needs to happen and it is happening. I thought that was really I mean, it is happening these days. I Googled it up right before this and um, it's all over, even in the Washington Post, which I thought was interesting since it's owned by a billionaire. Um, we have other clips. We have Peter Goodman. He's the CEO of Salesforce. And he's out there saying that CEOs are the heroes of the pandemic and talking about Davos, man. So, uh, you know, or, well, he wasn't saying that. He was talking about the issue around that. Let's take a listen. Benioff, who's the billionaire CEO of Salesforce, actually said... The CEOs are the real heroes of the pandemic. You know, not frontline medical workers, not people emptying bedpans in senior citizens' homes, not parents dealing with the hell of distance learning while trying to do their jobs and take care of children at the same time, not the people delivering our packages or, you know, taking real risks. The CEOs are the real heroes of the pandemic. And he said it multiple times. And he specifically said, the government didn't save you. We saved you, not for profit, but to save the world. And I, you know, some people, as I've told the story, have said, well, that was really a gaffe. I, you know, I, I don't think it's a gaffe. I mean, having spent a lot of time with, with billionaires, uh, it, it's, a, it's a fully formed worldview. And, and the genius of this species, and I think we have to understand them as a species, Davos man, is that he manages to craft these narratives in which we begin with the assumption that he's the good guy and anybody trying to deprive him of further wealth is therefore the bad guy. 
Uh, and, and then uh, the stars align. We get the magic of trickle down, uh, which in reality has worked, uh, where we're all supposed to benefit if the billionaires get more. That's worked zero times. And, you know, we've now run a multi-decade open air experiment in what happens when we entrust our problems to the goodness and generosity and forward thinking of the billionaire class. And what happens is democracy itself becomes untenable. Uh, when huge numbers of people quite rightfully conclude that their ability to pay the bills, to feed their children, to give them education, uh, when that doesn't matter very much to the people running the system, well, we don't know exactly how that's going to play out, but we know it's not going to play out well. Uh, and we can see the manifestations of that all around us, whether you want to talk about January 6th or low, roads, low rates of, of vaccination. We, people have lost faith in the elites, and that part's real because we keep betting on trickle down, which is only real in one way, and that's the part where Davos man ends up with more money. Fascinating stuff, Peter Goodman. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I don't even have anything really necessary to add to this, so let's move on. Brooke Harrington talked about the secular saints of capitalism and how if you fight them, they call you a Marxist. Let's hear. Keith Hart, the UK anthropologist, calls the, the wealthy of the world right now the secular saints of capitalism. It's sort of a takeoff on what... Um, Thorstein Veblen, the Danish-American sociologist, talked about with conspicuous <coughs> consumption and the leisure class. The, the quasi-deification of the rich, and especially the billionaires in the United States, and, and really in England and all of its former colonies, has made it almost impossible to question them in any way. It's, it's heresy. It's secular heresy. What will happen to you if you question why are there billionaires? Or how did they make their money? And was it fair? Are they playing by the same rules as the rest of us? And if not, why not? Everybody knows what happens when you raise those questions, right? What does happen? You get told that you're, you're an envious loser, right? <laughs> or a socialist. Or, or socialist. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Or both. <laughs> I got called a Marxist. I nearly got thrown out of the British Virgin Islands by a very, very irate wealth manager who called me a Marxist because I used the word inequality in the title of an academic journal article that probably no one besides my mother has read. <laughs> <laughs> They're very sensitive on this point. So you cannot criticize the saints without being a heretic. And that's why the voices of people like Chuck Collins and Abby Disney are so important because they can't be tarred with that brush. You can't call them envious losers because they were part of it. That means people will pause to listen to the, the heretic, even for just a moment. And that's an opening that we have to use. It's so interesting. I love it. And I, I, I think it's uh, it's kind of brave for these folks to step out and be like, we're rich, but really rich people are screwing things up. <laughs> I love it. Uh, coming up, Chuck Collins talking about philanthropy and how it's disconnected from reality and basically just a scam to exert control and evade taxes and also look good and feel good about yourself. Here he is. Even at its most innocent, billionaire philanthropy is wildly disconnected from the urgent needs facing the planet. If you look at the 2021 biggest, 50 biggest billionaire donations, you'll understand that the billionaires live in another world. None of those 50 gifts went to addressing current day issues of the pandemic, racial polarization, extreme inequality, climate disruption, and precarious democracy. 14 of the 50 biggest gifts went to the private family foundations of the donors. The other gifts went to kind of legacy and posterity gifts, big medical centers, big university buildings. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, hey, it's not all bad, right? I mean, there's, there's like Mackenzie Scott, right? She says, I'm going to empty the vault. This is good. But the key point here is that this is not Philanthropy is not a substitute for a fair tax system where wealthy people pay their fair share 
and where we have public investments in local, state, and federal infrastructure. Here are three examples of billionaire philanthropy run amok. Charlie Munger, you may have heard, gave $200 million to the University of California. He's not an architect, but his one condition is that the dorm rooms don't have windows. Or take Tennessee billionaire Willis Johnson. He gave money through his private foundation to the state of South Dakota to send a National Guard unit to the U.S.-Mexican border. Or Dick Uline, whose shipping company, basically his private family foundation funds election deniers and, and insurrectionists. Now, think about this. Who is subsidizing this charity? You are. This is your tax dollars at work. And here's the one statistic I want you to remember. For every dollar that a billionaire gives to charity, we taxpayers chip in 74 cents of lost tax revenue. That's because not only are they reducing their income tax, they're also reducing their estate, gift, and capital gains tax. When you're that wealthy, the bigger the subsidy. Ordinary people give to active nonprofits doing the work. But wealthy people give a very large percentage to intermediaries that they control. Private foundations, donor advised funds. Of course, some of this does great work. Some of the people in this room have done funded important organizing. But again, donors get tax reductions in the year that they give, but then it can sit parked in perpetuity in many of these institutions. Private foundations are only required to pay out 5% of their assets, and many of them treat that as a ceiling, not a floor. And donor advised funds have no payout requirement. As a result, we estimate there's like $1.2 trillion sitting parked in the charitable giving vehicles of the ultra wealthy. Philanthropy effectively enables this oligarch class a way of opting out of paying taxes while still exerting full ongoing control over their wealth. Absolutely. I, this is, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yep. Because if we just tax them and then we took the money that, that we got from their tax payments and we used it the way democracy voted to use it, that would be amazing. Um, I do want to give you a, little, a couple of figures here. I mean, this uh, would be nice if we have our democracy back. That would be very good. But here's, here's uh, a couple. Oh, wait. I had some figures about... Uh, if if we had the billionaires pay just five, I think it was 0.5% of their tax and taxes, worldwide billionaires, we we would be able to like educate the all, everyone who needed an education across the whole world, not just the US. And there are some other numbers I had for you too. I'll pull them up at the end, but let's just watch the last video that I have here. This um this is from the we're watching from the patriotic millionaires. Get together that happened in DC this past week. This is Saru Jaraman. Oh, Jaraman. Oh, Jaraman. <laughs> he talks about how restaurant chain CEOs are profiting from a tipping system that came from slavery. Let's take a listen. No greater epitome of an oligarchy than the CEOs of restaurant corporations that lead the National Restaurant Association maintaining the $2 wage that exists in our industry and comes straight from emancipation. Because at emancipation, the restaurant lobby sought to hire newly freed slaves, not pay them anything, and have them live entirely on tips, a new concept that had just come from Europe at the time. But in Europe, tips were always an extra bonus on top of the wage. When they came to the States, the restaurant and hospitality industry sought to basically mutate them from being an extra bonus on top of a wage to becoming the wage itself as a way to continue slavery. And so black women were told you get a zero dollar wage as long as tips bring you to the full minimum wage. That was made law in 1938 as part of the New Deal when everybody got the right to the minimum wage except for these millions of black workers. And we went from a zero dollar wage for tipped workers in 1938 to an incredible wage of $2.13 an hour in 2022. And 43 states in the United States and the District of Columbia persist with this legacy of slavery. Four out of five states in the US, it is $5 or less. It is a whopping $5.05 here in the District of Columbia. And we have allowed, we have allowed 
the Restaurant Association to get away with being really the only industry on earth, because we're the only country that does this anywhere on the globe, that says we shouldn't have to pay our own workers' wages, you the customers should pay our workers' wages for us. Because if you force us to pay our own workers' wages, we will go out of business, which is the exact same argument slave owners used, tobacco used, cotton used. If you force us to pay our own workers, we will go out of business. Absolutely. Now they're forcing the government to pay their workers because we are subsidizing their workers. Well, not the government, but us who fund the government. We are subsidizing the workers who are either small, you know, not paid a living wage by subsidizing their benefits, uh, food benefits. I don't want people who can't afford it to go hungry. I also don't want corporations who can afford it to not pay the people who are keeping them afloat. And we've got the chat blowing up here. I do want to give some quotes. This is some good stuff going on. Salgado says that Congress only gets more, not less corrupt year after year. There are no more Mike Gravel politicians. Excellent point. I mean, I think since Clinton got in and decided that the Democratic Party should take the same kind of corporate funding that the Republican Party decided to take and move further and further away from labor, what you think of labor or yes or no, whatever, um, of course, the parties are basically taking money from the same sides. I do push back a little. I do think there are politicians trying to get in. Um, we're covering a lot of folks uh, under Marianne Williamson's candidate summit where independently funded candidates are running for office all across this nation. And, uh, you know, it's politics. It's a dirty business. So, but I do, I do think some people in there are, are doing their best. We've also got another Salgado says that uh, billionaires are the apex of parasites, the successful criminals. Thanks everybody for how uh, the what's going on in the chat from uh, Fatah. I am I don't I have contacts on so I can barely see the tiny writing here. As you can see, I'm holding it uh, at a distance, but. Uh, yeah, so I uh, just apologize if I'm not pronouncing your handle properly, your name properly, but billionaires don't care how they, this is from Fatah, billionaires don't care how they make money. They care just about <clears throat> you should pay anything so they can force you to pay. Yeah, I mean, we got a lot of stuff here. I just want to give, I found a cool graphic that I thought might be an interesting way to kind of wind this up. Here is, this is a cool, let me, I'm going to even make it even bigger so my tiny face is small. Um, here's a cool graphic that that is um, comes from labnall.org about how to visualize what a trillion dollars is and a billion dollars, the big difference. So you've got up here in the upper, I guess, screen left hand corner, uh, $10,000. That's how much that would look like. And then a $1 million looks like this guy who I'm guessing is probably 5'9". How do you know? Uh, but, you know, the, an average sized human male um, is standing and that's what a million dollars looks like. It goes up to ankle height. A billion dollars. This is a beautiful visualization of how much more a billion dollars actually is. And, and the, 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 the percent of difference between million and billion and the obscenity of any one person needing a billion dollars. That is not uh, a government run by the people for the people and the other one people. Um, this year, a trillion. I don't know if you can see this, but right where my no, right where my finger is, is the guy in the tiny, tiny, uh, you know, lower left-hand corner. It's insane what a trillion dollars is. And thank you to Emmett Agarwal for putting this image together. We've got trillionaires in our midst. It's crazy. Um, thanks again for everyone putting comments. Privatized profits, socialized losses. That's what they love to do. Um, another comment from Twaganzate. Not sure if I can do it. Uh, and Salgado says, a to I think it's totally possible for low end millionaires to use that privilege to be good class traders and support anti-war labor organizers. Um, but that fades out. Yes. By the time someone is a billionaire, they are utterly addicted to the game. You said it. Abby Disney said it. I really appreciate everyone talking in the chat. My name is Juliana Forlano. Next week, I'm not going to be here. 
Uh, but the week after we'll be back and we're going to be talking about environmentalism. Please, people, I hope you are noticing what we're doing in this program. We aren't only bashing the Democrats when they deserve to be bashed. I just bashed them a little bit. Well, quite a bit for, for taking corporate money. I've said a million times on this program that the way to fix everything is publicly financed elections and that's it. <laughs> you know, so we could talk more about that. But we're talking environmental stuff in two weeks. Please notice what's happening on this show. We're not just, you know, liberals who are like, let's bash the Democratic Party because it gets us a lot of views on YouTube, even though it serves the fascist agenda. We're trying to be, not trying to be, we're just covering activism and what needs to be done here. And we are trying to give a voice to people who are out there doing the activist work, even if sometimes they're millionaires, which is kind of interesting for today. You can find more about that uh, event at, if you Google patriotic millionaires. And again, please tell your friends about our program on YouTube. You know, the, the online algorithms don't, unless you get into like, I'm going to fight with some right wing person about X, Y, Z. Nah, they don't really push your stuff forward there. It's like a right wing cesspool. <laughs> I dare say. So if you find something that you that you value about this show, I do ask you to please tell your friends about it. Tell them to watch it. I am on live at 1 p.m. on Thursday between 1 and 2. And uh, in the chat, put guests you want to see on the program, okay? And I will be happy to reach out to them and invite them on. We get a lot of good folks. And uh, I, I do thank you for watching and we thank you, Apple TV, for hosting us. Thank you, Roku, for hosting us. Um, and thank you for everything you do to help make this world a just and better place. I'm Juliana Forlano. We'll see you in two weeks.